It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Jason McCall will speak on superadditivity of Betty numbers. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I know everyone is sort of, the world's in sort of a rough shape right now, and I don't want to speak for the organizers, but I do think it's a good time for me to thank the organizers for putting this together and really making a, a nice welcoming community, even if it happens to be a virtual one right now. And I hope we get the, to continue that. I also wanted to say that I really enjoyed all the talks so far. Uh, they set a pretty high standard, which I hope I can come close to with this talk. Um, so what am I going to talk about? Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of a, this is sort of a survey talk um, at the, the risk of being a bit rambling and uh, unfocused. I want to try to touch on a lot of different things. So I'm going to start out with some notation. And then I'm going to talk about two different constructions that sort of say what is possible regarding uh, degrees of syzygies of ideals. That's going to be roughly the first half of the talk. I'm trying to make that the more accessible part. Um, then probably after the break, uh, I'll talk about the subadditivity condition, uh, when it holds, when it doesn't, what it means, and then talk about some more general bounds. Uh, if there's time, I'd like to get to a, a linear bound that is a couple years old, but fits into this story nicely. Okay, so with that said, let's get going. Uh, throughout my talk, K will denote a field. And please let me know if you can't read what I'm writing, uh, if it's too thin. I'm also going to keep the chat window open. So if you have questions, I'm going to try to keep an eye on that as we go. Uh, S denotes a polynomial ring over the field K, usually in n variables. I will let you know if that's going to change. Almost always, we're going to think of this as a standard graded ring, meaning the degree of all the variables is 1. And I want to denote by S sub i the k vector space of homogeneous degree i forms. So that means S can be written as a direct sum, say uh, S sub i from i equals 0 to infinity, at least as a k vector space with the usual multiplic multiplicative properties. Um, and I want to fix, for at least the moment, a, a graded S module. Make sure this is finitely generated. And I want to be able to move the grading around. So our usual notation is to put M parentheses J to be the graded S module with, well, the degree I part being the degree I plus J part of the original module. And several talks recently have gone through resolutions and Betty tables, so I'm only going to go through this relatively quickly. Um, there, we're going to be concerned with some finitely generated free modules. So I'll just remark, if you haven't seen this notation before, just think that S minus J is a rank one free S module. Oops. With generator and degree J. All right, so I mentioned resolution. So as we know, M has a, in this setting, finite, minimal, graded free S resolution. I'm going to write it this way, so F dot. And because I like Macaulay 2 so much, all my complexes and arrows go to the left. And in this setting, I guess P is going to denote the projected dimension. Uh, I.e., what do I mean? I mean that the zeroth homology of this complex is isomorphic to M. All the other homologies vanish for all I at least zero. And if I want this to be finitely generated and graded, well, all of the Free modules themselves should be direct sums 
of these twists of the ring S. And then I want to keep track of how many there are in each graded degree. And so the Betty numbers keep track of that for us. Um, to make sure it's minimal, though, I also need to require that the image of di is contained in the maximal ideal times the next free module. OK. Um, with all this set up, one of the things we you show in a homological algebra course is that this is unique, at least up to isomorphism, which implies that everything you could sort of pull out of the resolution is an invariant. So in particular, the graded Betty numbers, beta ij, are invariants of the module M and carry all sorts of interesting information, depth, dimension, multiplicity. Um, I'm going to focus on just a few different invariants, which we've seen in this seminar before. So projective dimension, I'll denote this way, which you could think of this as the maximum i, such that one of these Betty numbers doesn't vanish. The other invariant I want to talk about is the Casanova Mumford regularity, or just regularity for short, which one way to do it would be to say it's the maximum j, such that a beta i comma i plus j is non-zero. And the reason for the beta i comma i plus j instead of just beta i comma j, there are several reasons. But maybe the easiest one to explain is how it relates to the Betty table. Which if you've ever run Macaulay 2, you see a lot of these. Um, this is just the convenient matrix we use to keep track of the ranks of the free modules and degrees they show up when we sort of forget about what exactly were the maps in the resolution itself. This is often enough. And you can think that the projected dimension gives you the width of the Betty table. The regularity gives you the height, meaning, so I put beta 0, 0 here. And in position i, j, we put beta i, comma, i plus j. And so everything below this row corresponding to the regularity, everything to the right of the row corresponding to the projected dimension is zero. OK. A um, couple other invariants that are going to be the, the main players in this talk are the maximal and minimal graded shifts of the module. So this is slightly non-standard terminology but, or notation, but I think this sort of fits. Often people write just ti of m. I like to use the upper bar when I'm right, talking about the minimal and maximal shifts. This sort of resembles a notation in Boyce Soderberg theory. So this is the maximum of a j such that beta ij m is non-zero. Uh, you could similarly write this, let's see if I can squeeze this in, as the maximum j such that uh, tor i s m against k in degree j is non-zero. And that's the beauty of working on an iPad is that I get to move things around without erasing. So this is just the minimum of the exact same formula. So why should we care about this? Um, well, for one thing, notice that if you care about regularity, which has all sorts of interesting properties, then regularity is encoded just by the maximal graded shifts. So this is the maximum over all i from 0 to the projected dimension of m of t upper i m minus i. So in some sense, um, oh, there was a question, can any of these be, is that plus minus infinity? Um, I suppose that depends on your notation. I'm only defining these for the resolution itself. 
Um, so I, I'm not going to get into, you know, what happens if the resolution stops. So they're all finite numbers. Um, if you start with something that's generated in, in zero or positive degree, then these will all be non-negative integers. Um, so one thing you could ask when you see this is you can say, all right, if I know all the maximal graded shifts, I know the regularity. Maybe a more interesting question is, well, how many of those do you really need to know to get an effective bound on regularity? Um, so there's a very famous bound that says, if I know the degrees of the generators of an ideal, there's a doubly exponential bound on regularity. That's sort of um, not so satisfying. You might want something a little bit more effective than that. So I want to talk about, you know, how much of the resolution do you really need to compute in order to get at the regularity? Um, all right, so let's start with some naive questions. So naive question number one would be just to ask, well, what sequences are possible? So if I fix a finitely generated graded module over some polynomial ring, what sequences of integers are possible? Oops. And this is a naive question because the answer is, well, almost everything. Oops. So what do I mean by almost anything? Well, let me just say a quick blurb about uh, what Boyce Soderbergh theory has to say about this. Uh, so first, a graded S module is called pure if all of the maximal graded shifts equal all of the minimal graded shifts for all i. So, and there are several names I need to quote here. One of the things in Boyce Soderbergh theory was to figure out, you know, for which increasing sequences does there exist a module with exactly these maximal and minimal graded shifts? And the answer was basically everything. So, let's see, in Jason, order, yes. Jason, before you proceed with the theorem, there's a question on the chat, uh, whether some of these invariants that you defined can be infinite. Yeah, I think I answered that earlier. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm a, basically avoiding the situation in which that comes up. Okay, so in more or less chronological order, there was construction first by Eisenbud, Floystad, and Wayman. Although I'm going to put the year the papers were published here, so that's why they may be slightly out of order. Another construction by Eisenbud and Schreier. Uh, later constructions by Burkesh, Ehrman, Kamini, and Sam. This was 09, 13, and then later also by Floystad again. All of which give different constructions for the following. They say that for any sequence, of integers, let's write uh, D underline for the vector of integers that's strictly increasing, say D0 all the way to DC, there exists a pure Cohen-Macaulay S module M with, well, if it's pure, the maximal and minimal shifts have to be the same but we can also force them to agree with any increasing sequence of integers we choose. Um, I should mention, I guess the first construction only worked in characteristic zero, but now these, the rest I think work in all characteristics. Um, the one downside maybe to all of these constructions, at least many of them, is that M tends to have lots of generators. Some are more efficient than others. Uh, there are some really interesting questions about, you know, what are the minimal number of generators for a module such as that realizes this theorem? And I think a lot of those questions are still open. But that sort of brings us back to, you know, okay, the naive question was sort of silly. Let's modify it to a slightly more interesting question. Um, what sequences are possible when I think about cyclic modules only? 
or if you prefer thinking about ideals. And given the fact that lots of these constructions have many generators, they don't say too much about this question, at least not directly. Um, and the first thing you notice is, well, the, the answer is different than it is for modules. So clearly, uh, not every increasing sequence of integers is possible. Whereas the theorem up above says that it is possible if I go to the larger realm of modules, for cyclic modules, it's not. And so let's do a, a quick example. Um, Jason, you have yes. two new questions in the chat. Ah, two new questions. I see, what does it say if two modules have identical sequences? Um, I don't think there's a, an easy answer to that question. Uh, maybe someone else can answer that after the talk. Um, should the DI be weakly increasing? Um, no, I don't believe so. Uh, I think you need them to be strictly increasing. Um, okay, so let's take uh, the vector D to be this vector of increasing integers, 0, 1, 3, 4. Um, let's suppose that you had a cyclic module with exactly those maximal graded chips. So T upper I is DI for all I. Let's think about what this would say about the ideal in question. Well, the fact that T upper one is one, well, that says that I is generated by some number of linear forms, which means, well, that means I is generated by a regular sequence of linear forms, which means that to find the minimal resolution of S mod I, I can use a causal complex. On those minimal uh, linear forms, which means the maximal graded shifts should be i, right? The, the degrees should go up every single time I move down the resolution. So it should be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 0, 1, 3, 4 just isn't realizable in this setting. On the other hand, we know there is a module somewhere out there that has these maximal graded shifts. And if you want to see one, this one's actually fairly easy. So on the other hand, uh, there does exist a pure Cohen-Macaulay module M with maximum shifts 0, 1, 3, 4. And you can just check that if you take the co-kernel of this matrix, that this works. So you can plug that into Macaulay 2 if you don't believe me. OK, so the upshot is there must be some restrictions on the maximum graded shifts for cyclic modules and ideals. And the question is, well, what are they? Um, so the first part I want to talk about are you know, what is possible, and then we'll get into what isn't possible. Um, so some basics. And some of these apply even to modules, not just to cyclic modules. Uh, first, the fact that we're dealing with minimal graded free resolutions, say the degrees have to go up by at least one every single time, which says at least the, small, the minimal graded shifts are always strictly increasing. The same is somewhat true for the maximal graded shifts, at least for a little while. So T I minus one upper bar is strictly less than T upper bar I uh, for at least until you get to the co-dimension. And so this is the first exercise, if you haven't seen this before. Uh, 
So my hint is try dualizing the resolution and think about maximal graded shifts and what happens. Um, on the other hand, uh, this doesn't keep going. So, but T I minus one over bar M can be either greater than or equal to, or if you want strictly greater than uh, T upper I of M uh, is possible. for all i strictly bigger than the co-dimension of m. And so I thought I would show you a silly example of what this looks like. And it will seem less silly later when I want to apply this in a specific setting. So let's take polynomial ring and three variables. And m, let's use some color here. Uh, I'm going to take it to be a direct sum of two cyclic modules. So complete intersection on two cubes and a complete intersection on three linear forms. So then the maximal graded shifts are just the maximum of the maximal graded shifts of each of the two modules. So you should get something like zero, three, six, more or less because I need a causal complex to resolve this first guy of degree with elements of degree three. And then that one stops. And I only pick up the term from the resolution of the second guy. And you'll notice here, well, co-dimension is the minimum of the co-dimensions of the two guys. So the co-dimension here is two. And you'll notice I've got a situation where the maximal grade shifts can go down and can go down strictly. Okay, so that's a silly example, but I'm going to use it later because I want to know, can I do the same thing with ideals? So question two, how do we construct ideals with similar behavior? So what I want to try to talk about are two different constructions where the input to the machine is a module and the output to the machine is an ideal that whose resolution bears at least some similarity to the original module. And let's see if there's a question from Stephen Sam. It looks like it's just a comment. Uh, is there anything I need to say here? No, sorry, I didn't mean to derail your talk. Okay. Okay, just a comment. And increasing and decreasing oscillate, I'm not quite sure what that means. If it means can I make it go up and down and up and down, then yes, you can just take direct sums of various things and eventually you can do almost, I say almost any sequence you want beyond the co-dimension. There's restrictions based on what the minimal number or the minimal degrees of the generators were and the fact that the minimal shifts have to be strictly increasing, say you can't go backwards arbitrarily far. Okay, um, so, I'm sorry? I suppose to be fair, one should ask that question for indecomposables. Right, but the nice thing about the silly example is I can make an indecomposable module out of it in a, using some of these constructions. Okay. And I don't know the answer for the indecomposable version of that question. So option one, um, although I guess what I'm gonna say will bear to that question a little bit, uh, idealizations, or sometimes these are called Nagata idealizations, sometimes these are called uh, trivial extensions. This is gonna come up in a couple different ways in this talk, um, but first I wanna think about idealizations over the polynomial ring. So fix an S module generated in degree zero, let's say by, and I just really want to know that it has say M minimal generators, G1 through GM. Um, the standard graded ring, which I'm going to write as S direct sum M, is the graded abelian group 
where I now shift those generators into degree one. Um, and to make it a ring, I need to tell you what the multiplication is. So multiplication looks something like this, an ordered pair S comma M times an ordered pair S prime comma M prime looks like S S prime comma S M prime plus S prime M. And so why is this called an idealization? Well, we've taken the module and we've forced it to be an ideal in this new ring. So IE M becomes an ideal in this new ring, funny looking ring S plus M with square zero. So if I want to think about resolutions and ideals, I need to come up with a presentation of the standard greater ring as a quotient of a bigger polynomial ring. And that's actually not so hard. So let's define T to be a new polynomial ring. So notice this is a polynomial ring over the polynomial ring S. So this has all the the x1 through xn variables that were there before plus m new variables. And notice m here is the minimal number of generators of my original module m. Um, I is going to denote the ideal. Well, I'll take the square of the ideal generated by your new variables plus sum of ciyi such that cigi equals zero. And so you can check, it's not so hard, that S direct sum M is isomorphic to T mod I. So this is a presentation. It gives you explicit generators. And then you can ask, OK, if I know the generators, what does the resolution of this ideal look like over the new polynomial ring T? Uh, so let's give these guys names. Let's call this ideal A, let's call this ideal B. Then we get a short exact sequence. It looks roughly like the following. Uh, we take B mod A, uh, B mod, sorry, B mod A plus B to T mod I. Oops, T mod, sorry, let me backtrack a little bit. I'm going to say, ah, there it is. Let's start in the middle, right? T mod A here. Then I want uh, T mod I here. So let's see, that means I'd better have I guess I mod A here. That looks better. <laughs> OK, so this is the one I want to resolve. Um, this guy has a fairly simple resolution. This is a linear resolution. It's an Egon Northcott complex. It's fairly well understood. Um, this guy uh, has a resolution that's fairly easy to describe. This is a causal complex over the Ys. Well, now tensored up to the new ring T. Uh, tensored with, well, I'm thinking of this as almost the resolution of my original ideal. So F dot tilde is the resolution of the first syzygy module of M. Of course, now I have to think of it as a module over T. So change the base ring. Um, so this lift, this map of modules lifts to a map that's called I tilde of complexes. And the cone of that map of complexes then gives me a resolution of T mod I. It's not hard to check that this is actually minimal. So this is a minimal free resolution of T mod I. So, and the fact that this F tilde is showing up says most of the resolution of the module you started with is embedded inside the resolution of the idealization. 
Um, if this looks eerily familiar to things I've talked about in the past, there's a reason for that. So this is side trip number one. Uh, you know I like to talk about Riesz-like algebras. The Riesz-like algebra of an ideal is this funny looking ring where t is some new variable and i was an ideal of s. So you can think of this, if you think of the, the grading with respect to t, this is a direct sum s plus i plus s plus i, yada, 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 ad infinitum. If you take the Riesz-like algebra and kill t squared, and you think about what's left, well, this is an idealization of s with the ideal i. And the fact that t squared is a non-zero divisor on the Riesz-like algebra says that if I know the resolution of this guy, then I know the resolution of this one as well. At least I know the graded Betty numbers. Um, this last fact about Riesz-like algebras and their connection to idealization, I think was first pointed out to us by Maria Rossi. We weren't really thinking about it that way at the time, but that was the content of what we did. This was a, a construction that Irena Pava and I came up with when talking about the eisenberg goto conjecture. Um, but the point I was making here is that this is the same argument. Uh, you get the graded Betty numbers of the defining ideal of S I T T squared as above. Okay, so that's my, my side trip that I just think is a fun connection to what we're doing. Um, so what do idealizations really say about this question of realization of sequences of integers as maximum graded shifts of ideals? So I'm gonna quote a theorem of brook olery This is from 2013. Um, here we have to assume that the module we start with has increasing maximal graded shifts for all i. And let's just fix p to be the projected dimension and m to be the minimal number of generators of that module. So you could think of the input here as being one of those pure Cole Macaulay modules that we mentioned earlier. Think about the idealization and what you get basically by applying the argument up above is that the maximal graded shifts look like the following. They basically mirror what the maximal graded shifts of M were shifted ever so slightly for the beginning of the resolution. And then after that, you sort of have to pay a price. And here the price you pay is a long linear tail to the resolution. So the last maximal graded shifts look like the last maximal graded shift of M plus some adjustment factor. And this is for P less than or equal to I to P plus M minus one. So the way you should think of this is to think that here says I can do basically anything I want for the beginning of the resolution at the expense of a long, perhaps a very long linear tail to the resolution. Um, anything similar for minimal graded shifts? No, I don't think so. I don't know what this says in that case. Um, one thing I want to point out, because this will be relevant later, it's easy to check that the co-dimension of I is exactly little m. I'll, I'll make note of that later. I also should mention this is not exactly what Ulrey proved. She proved something a little more general where this plus one could actually be, uh, you could uh, change the degrees of the generators at the expense of the tail and you could sort of play this one off the other. But you always have to sort of pay some sort of price when you convert the module into an ideal. Um, so for instance, if you apply this to um, the canonical module of the quotient of a ring by some power of the maximal ideal. Well, power of the maximal ideal will have a resolution that goes linear for a long step and then has one big jump. So I can have 
ideals that go linear for arbitrarily many steps and then have an, as big of a jump as I could possibly want at the expense of a very, very long linear tail after that. Okay. So that's more or less what idealizations say about the picture. They say, I can do anything you want, any increasing sequence of integers, let's say starting with two, um, at the expense of having a long linear tail. What if I don't want that long linear tail? So option two I want to mention are Borbaki ideals. Um, so this is a bit classical. You can look up Borbaki's book. This is chapter, I guess, seven. Although um, the theorem I want to quote here is actually a bit more recent. So some people were thinking about uh, Borbaki's theorem in the graded context. So here I'm quoting from uh, Kumashiro in 19 and Herzog, Kumashiro, and Stamate in earlier this year. And remember, we're only dealing with the case where we're over working over a polynomial ring, but they prove something a little more general. I'll say what they prove in a second. But let's let M be a finitely generated, graded, torsion-free S module. Um, of rank R. And let's also insist that it is generated in degrees less than or equal to zero. So I can always shift it so that this is the case. Uh, if you want to think of something generated in degree exactly zero, that makes things easy. So what they show, more or less by digging into the proof of the Borbaki's theorem, says that there exists a graded what's called a Borbaki sequence, which looks like the following. M sits in the middle of this short exact sequence. A free module of rank R minus one sits at the beginning and an ideal, well, up to some shift appears at the end where M is an integer and I is a graded ideal. A uh, couple notes. Uh, S in their theorem need not be a polynomial ring. It need to only be uh, graded. The theorem normal domain. And then the same st uh, statement holds. Um, moreover, If M has no free sum end, we can take this ideal to have codimension two. And it can even be computed as the maximal minors of a very particular matrix you can get out of the presentation of M. Um, maybe I will skip some of the details there and just show you a quick example before we go to break. By the way, you might be wondering what this magic number M is. Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on the minimal number of generators, depends on the rank, depends on the presentation matrix. It's, it's a bit hard to piece out exactly what that's gonna be for any given example in advance. There is a question if the sequence above is canonical. Uh, well, I mean, there's sort of some generic choices that are going on here. Um, and I'll say a little bit more, there's a different notion of what's called a generic Borbaki ideal. Um, this is a notion of Simis Ork and Vasconcelos. That one is in some sense very canonical. Um, and there's some choice about where exactly you're gonna send the R minus one generators of, of S to the R minus one, but um, there's, it's sort of a, when practice, you can sort of pick them randomly and things will work out. Uh, do you need S to be a UFD to get code dimension two? That I'm not entirely sure about. Maybe someone can correct me there. Ah, there in degrees. So apparently that's the case. I will uh, add that. Thank you. 
I guess I was not thinking in the more general setting when I said this, so I'll put that comment in parentheses. S is certainly a UFD. Okay, so back to the silly example. I said I was going to use this. So we had this decomposable module. I'm going to mess with the grading slightly by shifting one uh, backwards three units and the other backward once. What I want to do is I want to think of a torsion tree module and the easy way to do that is to take a first syzygy module and by doing this I'm insisting that the first syzygy module of M is torsion tree. Right two and generated in degree zero. So it fits nicely into the theorem up above. So that means there is a Borbaki sequence that looks something like this. Uh, if the rank was two, I just need one copy of the ring. Here's sys one M. And in this case, the magic number for the ideal is four. And notice this module S isn't really going to change the resolution of the Syzygy module very much. It's basically going to cancel out one copy of S in the resolution of this first Syzygy module of M. So the resolution of I looks almost like the resolution of M, except here the price you pay is this number, right? I have to shift everything down four units to find an ideal with quote unquote the same maximal graded shifts as an arbitrary module. So the Betty table of S mod I looks something like this. So remember we had generators in degree four. And so you can sort of see the resolution of the first Syzygy module of M showing up. There I would have had a five in this case instead of a four. But I do get something in this case. And notice because the co-dimension of I is two, I get a situation where the maximal graded shifts uh, actually go backwards after the co-dimension, even for an ideal. So that can happen in this setting. Um, there's a question you can shift down by other values other than three and one as long as well so the three and the one were to get this to happen i wanted something generated in degree zero and that was why i chose three and one um okay so i think that's where i want to leave it for the first half so maybe we can take a five minute break and then we can talk about what can't happen after break so welcome back thanks for sticking around um so part one was all about what could happen. Part two is all about what can't happen. So I promised something about subadditivity. So let's start there. Again, we're dealing with ideals in a polynomial ring. So an ideal is said to satisfy the subadditivity condition. Ran out of room. if the following inequality holds, so if the eighth upper graded or maximum graded shift plus the beth one is always an upper bound for the A plus B maximum graded shift. And this is true for all integers A and B for which all of these numbers are defined. Uh, some remarks. First, this is not always true. This is not true for all graded ideals. It's not even true um, for Cohen-Macaulay ideals. Uh, I'll show you an example below where that can fail. Uh, it's not so hard 
to see that this is true for graded complete intersections. This is basically a consequence of looking at the causal complex and computing what the maximal graded shifts are. And no, I do not care about the low, lower graded shifts for most of the rest of the talk. Um, where this is really an interesting and open question is in the following settings. So when S mod, mod I uh, defines a Kazool algebra, um, when the ideal is a monomial ideal, um, and I haven't seen anyone explicitly uh, guess this, but I don't know of any counterexamples uh, when I is a toric ideal either. So I think that would be an interesting case to study. Um, but in particular, in the Kazool case, it's probably the case where we know the most. So let's call R the quotient S mod I. If this is Kazool, uh, then the following things are known. So the maximal graded shift in degree I is at most two times I. Uh, this follows from uh, work of Bakalin and Kempf. The I plus one maximum graded shift is at most the one in degree I plus two. And remember, since we're Kazool, we're definitely quadratic. So this is equal to T1 of R. So you can think of this as like one of the inequalities that you would want to hold for subadditivity, but it's not all of them. Um, and uh, T A of R plus T B plus one is an upper bound for T A plus B. Uh, if characteristic of field is zero. So both of these last two dots uh, are work of Vramov, Kanka, and Iyengar. And there, they explicitly uh, conjecture the subadditivity property for Kazool algebras. And you see, they, they get super close, but the, the plus one and the characteristic zero are maybe the, the two things hindering it from being a complete proof. Um, one thing you might ask, well, why is this interesting? Well, the failure of the subadditivity condition uh, is a witness for a generator of the Kazool homology algebra. Maybe I'll write it this way, uh, H star. So this is the Kazool homology in all of the variables um, against the cyclic module S mod I uh, in whatever particular degree you're considering, say A plus B. Um, so it's really kind of interesting to study when does this hold. Uh, there are definitely a lot of specific cases for monomial ideals where this is true, um, but the full general case, I believe, still remains open. If, if that's no longer true, someone should let me know later. So the first new thing I have to report uh, is joint work with, with Alexander Stachelianu. This is something we posted earlier this year that says, well, you give me an integer at least three, then there exists a graded quadratic Artinian Gorenstein ideal such that, uh, well, it's quadratic. So that means the first maximal graded shift T mod I is two, but you can have arbitrarily large first syzygies. And if you think about what this says about subadditivity, if subadditivity held, T2 would have to be at most four. So not only does 
the subjectivity condition fail for Gorenstein ideals, it fails in kind of as badly as it can. Uh, so in particular, uh, subjectivity can fail even for quadratic Gorenstein ideals. Which at first hint may be a little bit surprising given that the resolution is so symmetric and nice looking. Um, so how do you construct these things? Well, if you remember Mike Stillman's talk from about a month ago, they talked about uh, his work with Matt Mastroeni and Hal Schenk about constructing these quadratic Gorenstein ideals that uh, either were or were not Kazool in different instances. So we use a theorem of theirs on how you can construct Gorenstein things as idealizations. And since Mike did not really talk so much about this in his talk, I'll say a few words about it. So they showed the following. If you take an ideal S that you assume to be graded, quadratic just means everything is generated in degree two. Let's assume that the quotient is Artinian. And let's write R for the quotient S mod I. Let's write omega R for the canonical module of R. So in this setting, this would be X to N S mod I S, but then shifted by minus n, we want to assume that r is level, i.e. that the canonical module is generated in just one degree. And I want to set some other notation. So let's set r to be the regularity. M to be the type, or if you prefer the minimal number of generators of omega r. And finally, we get lots of nice statements. So if I call G this idealization, where we idealize r with respect to its canonical module with the appropriate shift, this is Gorenstein. That much was known classically. It's standard graded. That follows from the level condition. And he, the important part is that we get a presentation. So G is isomorphic to my original polynomial ring. Add M new generators modulo the following ideal. So if you remember before, we had the square of the y's, these things that look like the first syzygies of the module. So the only thing we have to do is drag the original defining ideal along and add that to the mix. So we have sort of three pieces that show up in the presentation. And so here I'm writing W1 through WM for the S module generators of omega R. Okay, but even better, maybe I wanna make something that's quadratic. Well, that means these generators in particular had better be degree two. How do we make sure that happens? Well, we need something stronger than level. So in particular, If omega r is linearly presented, this is what they call super level over r. Uh, it's actually sufficient, although not necessary, to be linearly presented as an S module. Uh, then 
g is actually quadratic, that follows basically from the presentation, and well, you get to drag along properties of R. So for instance, if R is not Kazool, then uh, G is not Kazool. So that actually follows uh, from a result of Gullickson. Uh, I'll also refer you to a paper by Kanka, Iyengar, Wynn, and Romer, which uh, proves something very similar. Okay, so what's the strategy here? I wanna construct something Gorenstein that somehow has large first syzygies, maybe I should find something that's Artinian, quadratic, with large first syzygies that is super level and see if we can apply it in that setting. So we need a quadratic, super level, Artinian, ideal, uh, with arbitrarily large first syzygy, arbitrarily large degree first syzygy. And it turns out these aren't so hard to construct. Uh, the easiest construction is to take a complete intersection of 2s squares and one more sort of generic element and square that. So what, what work, what's going on behind the scenes? So this is a complete intersection. Uh, this guy here is a left Schetz element for that complete intersection. That basically tells us the Hilbert function of the, the entire quotient of S modulo this ideal and that tells us everything you could want to know about, or at least enough about the resolution to know that it's quadratic, that it has uh, a syzygy of degree S and that it's super level. So that's basically the, the proof of what's going on here. Um, I quadratic crucial for number three, yes. Um, I mean, well, if, if I is not quadratic, then you have no hope of G being Kazool. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just make uh, a couple of uh, comments here. This is a second aside. Uh, we get a couple extra things by applying their construction. So as a bonus uh, for S at least seven, uh, we get a quadratic, uh, Gorenstein ideals with non-unimodal Hilbert functions. This was a, a question that came up implicitly during Mike Stillman's talk, I think. Um, although uh, this was not the first instance of quadratic Gorenstein ideals with non-unimodal Hilbert functions. Uh, there's another construction by, um, so I'll say C also, uh, Gundam and Zipala. Um Other bonus, um, we also show basically by applying their idealization construction again in this setting that uh, we can construct uh, quadratic Gorenstein ideals that are not Kazool, but have linear resolutions of k over r for arbitrarily many steps. So there were, I think Mike Stillman mentioned this funny example of Roos that shows there is no finite test for the Gazul property if you just want to try to compute the resolution of k over r and hope that you'll see a failure of linearity at some step. His construction, at least one of them was Artinian, but not Gorenstein, and you might hope, well, maybe for Gorenstein ideals, there is a finite test, and basically the answer is there is no hope for a finite test, even for Gorenstein ideals. Okay. On the other hand, before I move on, let me just mention, here's open question number one. 
I mentioned I was going to talk about several things I don't know the answer to. Um, we know this ideal we get by idealizing. We have the presentation. We know it's Gorenstein. We know a lot about its resolution, but I don't. I can't tell you everything about it. So what does the full resolution of maybe I'll say the defining ideal of G look like. Remember, I gave you the full resolution of the idealization of a module over a polynomial ring, but now you know, we're idealizing over R, not over S anymore. And we can get a presentation, but because there's um, these three pieces, oops, where was it? To the presentation, here we go, right? It's a bit more complicated to say what the resolution of that ideal is fully. We know it's Gorenstein, so it's symmetric. We know the Hilbert function, if you know the Hilbert function of R, but that doesn't rule out some consecutive cancellations going on among the Betty numbers. And I don't seem to have a good handle on what's going on there. So if anyone can tell me the answer to that, that would be cool. Okay, so that's specifically what I wanted to say about subadditivity. What about more general results? Right, maybe you're not happy that subadditivity only has a hope of holding for certain ideals. Maybe you want theorems that hold for all ideals. Um, so notice, if we're talking about an arbitrary ideal, and let's say I have a linear form, so something in S1, let's pretend that this is regular on S mod i. Well, then the Betty table of S mod i is the same as the Betty table of, let's call it S bar over i bar for S bar being S modulo of this linear form. So I can keep modding out by, say, a regular sequence of linear forms and reduce down to the case when the depth is zero. So I'm going to do this for the remainder of the talk. Or if you prefer, I also under Buchsbaum, I'm assuming that the projected dimension is the same as the number of variables in the polynomial ring. So I'm going to do this from now on implicitly. OK, so for the general results, I think the story really starts with a paper of Eisenbud, Hunicke, and Ulrich. This is from 2006. And there, there are a lot of things in this paper, but there are two in particular I want to highlight. So they show that if the dimension of S mod i is less than or equal to 1, then we get the following inequality on maximal graded shifts. The A gr maximal graded shift plus the B one is an upper bound for the last one for all A and B that add up to N. So I like to call this uh, sort of a weak convexity inequality, right? It's sort of like the subadditivity condition, but only when the two integers add up to the last element the last index in the resolution. Um, the other result I want to mention is this is more general. So it says if I have any module of dimension at most one, and let's assume that the annihilator of that module contains a regular sequence uh, of degrees. let's say D1 through DC, then we can sort of control what goes on at the end of the resolution in a different way. So the last maximal graded shift is at most 
the one in degree n minus c plus the sum of the degrees in that regular sequence. So, and as far as I know, this is still an open question, which I've asked in the past and still don't know the answer to, is this hypothesis that the dimension of S mod I in part one, or if you apply it to part two and think of M as a cyclic module, is this necessary? I still don't know any counter examples to that statement. Um, maybe a small bit less optimistic than I was several years ago, but I would like to know how that goes. Okay. So what else can we say in more generality, right? What if you don't like this extra hypothesis and you want to be able to say something about all ideals? Um, so let me just comment that number one above implies that the nth maximal graded shift is at most the minimum over all a plus b equaling n of ta plus tb. So you could ask, is this true um, if dimension is not necessarily at most one? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but several years ago, I was able to use uh, the numeric to boy soderberg theory and prove the weaker statement that if you replace the min with a max, this is true. And then about a year later, uh, Herzog and Srinivasan proved something stronger still. This is in 2013. That, again, both of these are with no assumptions on the ideal whatsoever. That the last maximum graded shift is at most the first one plus the penultimate one. And so this, since this is one of the terms in that maximum up above, this is definitely stronger. It's still weaker um, than the thing I hope to be true, um, but I don't know how to prove the thing I hope to be true. Um, maybe at this point, I'll also mention that they also show that if I is a monomial ideal, then you have the exact same inequality, but anywhere in the resolution. So TA is bounded above, whoops, let me write it this way, TA plus T1 is an upper bound for TA plus one. So again, that's, one of the inequalities you'd like to be true in the subadditivity condition, but it's only one of them. So even for monomial ideals, that's still open. So last thing I wanted to mention was how you get a bound on regularity using only some of the maximal rated shifts. So this is a, a result of mine from just a couple years ago. Again, there's no assumption on the ideal at all. So I is any graded ideal, and I want to fix C to be the co-dimension or the height. So then the regularity, remember I can always bound, write the regularity as the maximum of Ti plus I. Can I get away with some subset of the Ti's? And so here's one thing you can do, you can look at all of them except the last co-dimension number of steps and compute this slightly bigger number. Look at the i-th maximal graded shift plus 
n minus i times t1. Sorry for running out of room. And then uh, I'll continue it down here. You can add a minus n down below. Or in particular, if you want to think in terms of maximal graded shifts, uh, the last one to compare with some of the previous results is less than or equal to this number. So it's, it's a linear bound in terms of the first n minus c shifts, which let's think about um, the idealizations in, or Brooke Ulrey's construction earlier. These were what she called her designer ideals. Or in the idealizations that we constructed earlier, we had uh, arbitrary T1 all the way to Tn minus C. But then we had this long linear tail that was exactly co-dimension number of steps long. So I sort of think of this result as sort of complementing her construction about what can happen. This is one way to sort of bound what can't happen in the resolution of ideals. And so I guess for the last few minutes, let me just try to give an idea of the proof. So we didn't assume anything about I, so I definitely contains a complete intersection. of forms, let's say F1 through FC of degree less than or equal to T1 S mod I. Okay, so the nice thing is we know what resolutions of complete intersections look like. They look like causal complexes. So let's write I or R for the quotient. by this complete intersection. And we can create a short exact sequence that looks like the following. R surjects onto S mod I. And then, well, there's a kernel. Okay, so let's think about what the resolutions of the individual pieces in this short exact sequence look like. Um, and let's think about their length. So what does the projected dimension over S look like? Well, um, if the projected dimension here is N, and this is a causal complex of necessarily length C, well, various long as that sequence or depth counting arguments say that if N is bigger than C, this has projected dimension one smaller. So this gives you an idea, well, hey, maybe I can induct do reverse induction on projected dimension. Um, there's a couple things I need to say here. So, but that's the basic idea. You do reverse induction on projected dimension over S. Um, there's a couple caveats here. What happens when you get down to projected dimension C? Well, then you can apply the Eisenbahn, Hudeke, Ulrich, um, two uh, up above. So basically it's sort of, re you reduce down to that case and work your way backwards. Now, unfortunately, the way I've stated this, it doesn't look like I can do induction because this is a cyclic module and this, well, isn't. So you have to modify the statement to something that can be, you can use induction on for modules. The, the wording gets messy. Um, so I'm not gonna go into any more of the details here, but. Uh, you need an inductive statement for modules, and I'll just say it gets messy. But I've tried to, the, the final statement I think is somewhat clean and satisfying. Okay, so I promised 
at the very end, I would say a little bit about some more open questions. Uh, let's see, I'll just check the chat box. Do I think there's a way of considering weighted convexity such as B T sub A plus A T sub B? I have no intuition about whether that would work or not. It's an interesting question. So let me just end with a few of my favorite open questions that I would really like to know the answers to. Um, First of all, um, we know that subadditivity fails even for Cohen Macaulay ideals. The construction I gave earlier was that it failed at the first syzygy step, right? So when A plus B was two, you can tensor different counterexamples together and sort of push the failure of subadditivity further and further along in the resolution. Uh, so I'll just say taking sums, you can make it fail for at least even integers a plus b at most half of n. Um, but by the Eisenbeid Hunicke Ulrich, uh, I guess this is number one up above, it holds when a plus b is exactly equal to n, what happens in between? Does it, is, is that the worst you can do? Could you somehow create a, a, a test for being cone macaulay based on whether uh, subjectivity failed beyond the halfway point of the resolution? Or you could modify this and say, all right, I know I can produce these sorts of ways in which subjectivity fail, but does that say that uh, the maximal graded shifts are at most the maximum of what you would expect by looking at just T1 and T2? And this is sort of a modification of a question I think Craig Kuniki asked several years ago. This is false in general, but you know, maybe for the Cole Macaulay case, I think there's still a chance that this is true. I don't certainly don't know any counterexamples to this. Um, and finally, let me just end with one of my other favorite open questions. Uh, this one was proposed by uh, Constantinescu, Kala, and Barbaro. So they ask the following, they ask, is there a family of quadratic, so in our language, T1 is two, uh, linearly presented, so in our language, T2 is three ideals with the following limit. So if I compare the regularity, either with the projected dimension or just the number of variables, can you make regularity grow linearly with respect to the length of the resolution? Certainly you can do this with complete intersections of quadrics, but those aren't linearly presented. And this seems to hint at a restriction on resolutions that we don't really understand. I don't know how to prove this. Um, I certainly don't know any counter, any examples that make this true. And I'd be very interested to see if anyone can come up with such an example. But I think maybe that's a good place to wrap up. So thanks for stopping by. Is 1B open in the monomial case? Ooh, that's a good question. 1B open in the monomial case. I, I don't know. I will have to think about that. Okay, and you have two more questions in the chat.
Uh, which ones did I miss? One of them is whether it makes sense to consider different type of convexity, sort oh, of like I, weighted convexity. Where yeah, I, I mentioned that one earlier, and I I don't know. It it might. Okay. And the other one I missed. Well, I'm not sure what he's referring to because regular subjectivity is falling in many places. I mean, he typed um, this later, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so all I was saying up above was that you can make subjectivity fail for Cohen Macaulay ideals in lots of different places, but the way you do it is sort of artificial. Um, and so 1B is sort of a way of saying, well, these, this is sort of the worst I can do. Can you do worse? Okay, and then there is a question by Alessio about your theorem with uh, Alex. Are the quadratic Gorenstein ideals which fail subjectivity non kazoo by construction? Uh, well, they have to be, because if you're Kazool, you would have uh, first syzygies that are either linear or Kazool, and so they'd be at most degree two. So, because the first syzygy is so high, they can't be Kazool. Are there any other questions? It seems there are no other questions. Thank you for a great talk.